Hello. Hello. Good morning and welcome to Hillcliff's online service on Sunday the 21st of February. Uh, a quick reminder that you will find children's church resources each week on our website to help families with younger children uh, enjoy church together. Our prayer meditation sessions continue each Sunday and Wednesday from 2 to 3 p.m. at the church. No bookings are required for these sessions. Each Sunday evening we will have a prayer gathering on Zoom from 6 to 7 p.m. Everyone is invited, um, so contact Stuart or Catherine slash mum or dad um, for a Zoom invitation. Youth groups continue on Zoom on Sundays and Fridays. Uh, a big thank you to all who have given food and finances to help out with the flood victims in Warrington. Today's sermon is the second in our Lent series from Luke 4, Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness. Today's teaching is from mum. Uh, please enjoy the service today. It always helps to click like and share. Um...
stand against our God. Mover of mountains, breaker of chains, Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won. against our God. Good morning, everyone, and uh, let's pray together just at the start of our service this morning. Um, thank you, Lord Jesus, for uh, your love for us. Thank you, Father, for being our good Father in heaven. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence with us now. We want to pray at the start of our service, Lord, for our brothers and sisters, particularly we pray for John Wogan and his family, Karen, June, Francis and their families, as uh, June's funeral service is on Monday. Uh, we do want to uphold them and pray that your comfort, your blessing, your peace might rest upon them, that the word of the Lord might be a comfort to them and a blessing to them. We pray also for, um, for the Prest family, uh, particularly on Friday, where the funeral service for Keith uh, takes place. We pray for Lynn, Andy, Craig and for the, the extended family as well. Lord, um, thank you so much that we are able to see with confidence that for both June and for Keith, uh, they, they are people of faith and their, their destiny, their presence right now in your presence is secure. And, uh, and we love that, Lord. We love the confidence that we have in Jesus. We continue to pray for Lord Roger and Marlon and for good health for Marlon to continue, albeit slowly, we pray for continual progress in the name of Jesus. And for others right now who are struggling with their um, health, Lord, whether physical or mental, we uphold them in your presence. Lord, may your peace be poured out uh, upon them today. Um, Lord, we pray for our country and particularly for decisions that have to be made by our government over the next few weeks about um, decisions to unlock, particularly in schools and in wider society as well. Give them wisdom, Lord. Um, uh, may they take care in their decisions, listen carefully to those who would advise them from a position of uh, expertise and wisdom. Uh, we pray, Lord, that um, that you would give them the wisdom of the Lord above all things. Uh, we pray not only for our own country, but we pray particularly for countries who are struggling with um, either not being able to afford vaccines or not having distribution already set up because of poor infrastructure. And we pray, Lord, particularly for the heart of those who hold power and influence in this area, pray particularly for our own country and for the G7 and for other wealthy nations that we would share um, generously um, the vaccinations that we have with those who have at the moment who have none. Um, uh, may we demonstrate, Lord, um, uh, grace and um, mercy as we, as we extend and open the storehouses uh, of our bounty for others as well. Uh, Lord, may your peace rest in this service today. Pray for Catherine as she um, preaches a little bit later. And uh, we uphold our brothers and sisters today and we pray for a blessing over the town of Warrington. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 4, 1 to 13. Jesus is tested in the wilderness. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to them, I will give you all their authority and splendour. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The le devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Thank you, Ruth. It says in this passage that Jesus was led by the Spirit 
into the wilderness. But the spirit didn't just whip Jesus away like Scotty beaming James T. Kirk back up to the Starship Enterprise, away from all the fun that he's having on a random planet. Jesus was led by the spirit into a time of fasting and hardship, but not against Jesus' will. Jesus chose this wilderness experience. Jesus didn't eat anything deliberately for 40 days, which was a conscious decision. I don't think he was so caught up with the spirit that he forgot to eat. He was partnering with the spirit. I think it helps to remember that. Otherwise, we can think that fasting is only for certain very holy people who get caught up in some kind of ecstatic experience. It's actually for anyone, any child of God, who is willing to let discipline help them partner with the Spirit in the kingdom work. Jesus knew that his encounter with the Spirit and with Satan was so significant that he needed to press into it. He needed to subject even his body to it. He also subjected his emotional and social needs in order to be led by the Spirit. Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness didn't just mean no eating, but also no company. And Jesus clearly loved company and eating together with people. It's one of the nicest things that I find about the Gospels, um, how we could laugh with people and enjoy people's company. Now, all that's good, isn't it? Food's good, company's good, having our emotional, social and physical needs are all good. But we know, don't we, <laughs> that we often fill the need that we have for encountering God, um, for spiritual discipline. We often replace that with other stuff. It could be the beer at the end of a humdrum day, the PlayStation after a tense set two with a sibling, a long chat with a friend when we feel down about stuff. All really good stuff. None of these things are bad. But it's clearly very easy for us. We'd all identify with the fact that we replace God with them so that we no longer go to God for counsel about our hard workplace experiences, our family issues. We go to our friends instead. Or when our relationship or our self esteem is at a low point, it can be easy to turn to the comfort of alcohol rather than turning to God or an affair and so on and so on. It is running through the course of human history and running through the course of our own lives. Sad but true. So fasting and withdrawing from normal life in order to focus on God gives us a time to repent. It also gives us a time to find clarity. It helps our discipline and it helps us refine our sense of purpose. It doesn't necessarily give us new purpose. I think that often we feel like that's what we expect to happen at a time of prayer and fasting. But actually, sometimes it isn't about getting a new purpose. It's actually about refining our sense of who we are, our clarity about our purpose that's already been given to us. Both of these are really important. Now, Jesus modelled the kind of determination and resolve and discipline that I'm talking about here throughout his ministry. He resolutely set out for Jerusalem, it says, knowing that his death waited for him. His resolution and determination resolve scared his disciples because they really struggled to follow him. But actually, these 40 days of fasting are part of that willing subjection. It's part of his journey. They're a vital part of it. He chose to fast here, not because he wanted to experience hardship and hunger as some kind of like weird spiritual experience, but because he was willing to face what lay ahead and was willing to be disciplined and to prepare for it. Jesus, like us, clearly was subject to the physical realm and the needs and the desires of this physical realm. Our physical, social, emotional needs are real and important. They need to be met. When they aren't, it's very obvious. I'm sure that Jesus, when he came out of the 40 days in the desert, must have looked pretty awful, haggard, maybe didn't smell very great, I don't know. Maybe his beard was a bit unkempt. And he must have looked really, really drawn. 40 days without food, that's something serious. It was obvious that his physical and emotional needs weren't being met. But Jesus did it. He did it because he knew that there was a whole other realm that we needed to be aware of, that he was engaged in, the spiritual realm. 
Jesus is about to bring the kingdom of God into the midst of the kingdom of darkness through his ministry. And he knew it was coming with a fight. This was the beginning of it. And he was squaring up to it. He was facing up to it. In Philippians 2, we're told that Jesus is Lord of all. That everything and everyone is subject to him. But that didn't come before he had humbled himself. He was prepared to be subject to the common hardships of hunger and aloneness and the common problems of humanity. But he partnered with the Spirit in this so that his hardships would discipline him for the fight ahead. Everything was with a beautiful purpose with Jesus. His testing and temptings open our eyes to what faces us and how we face it. Because this passage doesn't just talk about physical hardship. It also talks about spiritual hardship at the hands of the enemy. Satan tempted Jesus relentlessly for those 40 days. And actually, we can all appreciate what that was like, even if we think that we don't, because we all go through the same thing. We all go through temptation. It might not have been with the intensity and horror of what Jesus went through, but we can understand because we've been there. Jesus showed, though, that despite the fact that Satan attacked him in the most vulnerable places with no mercy, Satan did not have lordship over him. Jesus was subject to the common weaknesses of humanity, but he was not subject to Satan. He shows us that if we are the sons and daughters of God, we are not subject to Satan either. And it's such an important point when we face temptation. We face the same battle with the kingdom of darkness if we are the children of God. And the devil doesn't abide by lockdown rules. He will go within two metres of us. He will invade our space constantly if he's allowed. Now, there are times where God allows it to happen, like we see here with Jesus, um, or with Job is the classic story. But it's often that we allow the devil far more access than he should have. He is not our Lord. Jesus is Lord. We may not like Satan, invading our space and our heads but Jesus shows us the way out and he also shows us how to resist the devil how to not give him more space than he's allowed now Satan's first line of attack with Jesus is in verse 4 which is really the one that we're going to look at today if you are the son of God Satan says tell this stone to become bread now, Satan isn't really attacking the problem of Jesus' hunger here. He is not even remotely bothered about Jesus' welfare. He isn't bringing up the fact that um, Jesus is hungry because he's trying to highlight, oh, you should really go and get something to eat. Why don't you get yourself something to eat? He is really attacking Jesus' identity and his relationship with his father here. And he is using him at his weak spot, spot to try and do that. If you are the son of God, he says. Now in chapter three, Luke has already established who Jesus is, the son of God. And he does this in three different ways. He does it first by pointing out that John the Baptist prophesied about the Lord by the power of God's spirit. And then secondly, we hear God say at Jesus' baptism, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So God himself affirms by his voice that Jesus is his son. And thirdly, Luke writes out the whole of Jesus' genealogy all the way back through David and Abraham to Adam, who in the end of chapter three is called the son of God. So Luke in three different ways is reiterating Jesus is the son of God. And this is affirmed by the prophets, by God himself. It is affirmed by history and it has been revealed through history so in a way it is go it goes without saying but this is the first thing that the devil attacks now Jesus fasting and praying in the wilderness was preparation for a world changing ministry that only he could do so we may not be able to identify totally with with that but still Satan tries to get Jesus to disobey the Spirit's leading. We can identify with that. Because the Spirit has encouraged 
Jesus to fast for the sake of the kingdom. But by implicitly questioning this, Satan is undermining Jesus' relationship with the Spirit. So he's undermining his relationship with the Father. He's undermining his relationship with the Spirit or trying to, which he will do with us as well. And we can identify with that. How many times does it happen to you that you have committed to do something for the Lord, that you feel the Lord, the Spirit has led you to do something? And then you start questioning. You start thinking, oh, I'm being a bit of an idiot now. I'm sure it wasn't God that told me to do that. It was probably just cheese if it's a dream that you think God has used. Or if you feel like you've been given a word that you doubt that actually came from God. I mean, whose voice is telling you that? Yes, we weigh the spirits, but do we give them up because we actually start to doubt ourselves, or that it's the spirit? How often? And we see here that Jesus was tempted by the devil to doubt the Holy Spirit's leading. He does it to us as he did it to Jesus. Now, Jesus' world change in ministry would lead Jesus to his death. His victory would not be complete until he had suffered, died, been resurrected and had ascended to the right hand of God, his Father. His full vindication, when every knee would bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, will only come at his second coming, <laughs> which hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but Satan undermines all this. He undermines the Father's aff affirmation of him as his son and he tries to undermine his vindication by getting him to take his vindication in his own hands he doesn't want any of this to happen so he tries to get Jesus to disobey his father which would mean abandoning God's word abandoning God's plan abandoning God's tr his trust in God Jesus has already received all the affirmation that he needed from God this is my son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. But Satan, as we know, looks for weak spots. And he knows that our identity and our need for affirmation is a very, very weak spot. So he goes for it in Jesus. Satan is a dab hand at this. He's had millennia upon millennia of experience of tormenting humans. <laughs> He's seen it all. He has seen people fall, even those who are called and chosen by God. He saw Esau give up his birthright for a bowl of soup. He saw Abraham and Sarah try to bypass God's promise by using their slave Hagar to have a baby rather than wait for God's promise. He's seen it all, Satan, and he's used it time and time again, attacking our identity, attacking our affirmation from the Father. Now, Jesus has been anointed by the Spirit and affirmed by his Father and been given a world-changing mission. But he is now hungry and haggard and dirty and weak in the desert. Satan has seen billions of people forget themselves and God because they struggle with loving and trusting God while facing hardship. He knows how to exploit this weakness. He did it to Jesus and he does it to us as often as he possibly can. He wants here to try and get Jesus to forget who he is and why he's there. He wants Jesus to place his needs and desires before his trust in God, to forget that his fasting and his self-denial is voluntary, that it is for a purpose, that Jesus is partnering with God in this. He wants him to start thinking that actually somehow God is doing him out of something. God isn't his father, he's his slave driver. And we can hear that sometimes in our own head, can't we? The way that Satan tempts Jesus is common to us all. Adam and Eve, who first fell to temptation, are our common ancestors. And Satan's malignant proposal to Jesus here, if you are the son of God, prove it has the same insinuation as his question to Adam in Genesis 3. Did God really say that you couldn't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Really? If you are the son of God, Adam, if you really are the children of God, Adam and Eve, if you are really made in his image, created to have a relationship with him, created to enjoy everything that he's made, Surely he wouldn't deprive you of this. That doesn't make sense. It seems like there's a little bit of a weird thing going on here. Weird power play. 
totally undermining the character of God or trying to. Satan says to Adam and Eve, prove that you're blessed by God by taking the best fruit, for surely that's what God wants for you. How easily he undermined their trust in God. God gave Adam and Eve everything. All the good gifts they had came from God. They had a relationship with God. They had a consciousness and an appreciation of life and beauty that no other creature had. And they had the will and the intelligence and the creativity to enjoy everything that had been given and to make the most of it because they were made in God's image. But they were not God. And the trees of knowledge and of life are symbols of that consciousness that God is God and we are not. We are his children. We are not God. To submit our will to God's, to show we can follow our God-given conscience, to accept the truth that God is God and we are not, and to trust God is the purpose of the trees being in the garden in the first place. But Satan totally undermines that. Before Satan tried to make the truth a lie, God's children were happy to accept the presence of these trees, beautiful trees, symbolic of the divine nature of God, to look on them and to give glory to God for their beauty without feeling any need to take them. Satan ruined that because he poisoned them to the word of God. He poisoned God's promise to his children. Now, here is Jesus, who is called the last Adam, who came to bring us back to God. That is his purpose. So it is really, really important that these echoes are coming up. We should hear these echoes, these kind of like parallels between um, Jesus and, and Adam or, G, or Jesus and Moses or whatever we can hear in this, in this passage. It's meant to be, they're meant to be these echoes because Jesus is the last Adam who has come to make all things new, who has come to restore us and redeem us. But who the heck does Satan think he is? <laughs> who is he to say what love is, what provision is, what protection and blessing and purpose is? Who is he to dispute God, his word, his character? Who is he to doubt God's love for his children? Well, you know what? We should ask those questions when we face temptation. Those questions come from righteous anger. And that's where we're meant to feel. When we face temptation, there is a place for this. Jesus had righteous anger at God's name and character being twisted and he ref refused the devil in this. He resisted the devil with this righteous anger, with this desire to honour the Lord, his father, more than anything. Jesus is facing the same temptation that Adam faced to doubt the affirmation of God and his promises to his children. If you are the son of God, why do you have to be deprived, Jesus, of anything? Surely everything is in your reach and power if you're the son of God. If? Who is Satan to doubt the word of God? Who has already affirmed and blessed his son, Jesus? Who is Satan to doubt the word of God? Satan's not dumb, though. He doesn't often blatantly attack God because he knows we're just as likely to jump to God's defence if he's too blatant as to doubt him. And you know why? Do you know why we're going to jump to God's defence? Because he is truly our father. He is our father. We are the children of God. So Satan instead chooses to attack the weak links. And that is us. <laughs> he is most likely to attack our sense of identity, our identity, which is what he does to Adam and to Jesus. Well, God is God, Satan might say, but who are you? Who are you to claim to be his son or his daughter? And because we are very aware of our own weaknesses, and we get confused, don't we? Because here Jesus had real physical weaknesses that were must have been really preying on him, his, his intense hunger, and 40 days deprived of society and the wilderness. We get confused, though. We think that our weaknesses our physical, emotional, mental, spiritual weaknesses set us too far apart from God. And we can often fall to fall prey to the Satan saying, you don't have any right to be the children of God. 
who are you to be the child of God? Look at you, you ragged, ragged, haggard, <laughs> stinking, dirty, hungry wretch. Who are you? You who has this problem with anger. Who are you who has this problem with your relationships? Who are you who has such a struggle with your background? Who has such a struggle with dependence on the wrong things? Who are you to say that you can be a child of God? But none of us are going to be able to come through temptation the way that Jesus did because he's perfect. But we give him far more credit for truth than we should because we are the children of God. <laughs> Adam fell to Satan's deception, but Jesus didn't. He remembered what Adam forgot, that God is God. That he is true, perfect and holy. That he is love. His word is our bread, our breath, our life. Jesus didn't even bother to justify that he was the son of God. He focused instead on his father, on who the father is, on his trustworthiness, his faithfulness. Jesus focused on the value of God's word, which is true and faithful and brings life. God's word is spiritual food that sustains our identity. He knows that we face hardships. But facing hardships doesn't mean that God is not our father, or that God has abandoned us, or that God isn't as great as he claims to be. Not that God needs to claim to be great. He just is. He's revealed as that through everything that he does. And Jesus here quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 8 when Moses is speaking to the Israelites after passing through the 40 years in the wilderness, not 40 days. But you can see the symbolism of it, can't you? Deuteronomy 8 says, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what is in your heart whether or not you would keep his commands. Jesus did this. Jesus did this. He knew that this is part of life. He knew what the Lord God does. He knew, he knew how the Lord uses testing. He humbled you, Moses said to the Israelites, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that people do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. That is what Jesus quotes, coming from a time of intense testing and hardship in Israel's history. Moses says to them, Your clothes did not wear out, your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. And Jesus knew that. The Israelites were the children of God, like Adam and Eve, but they forgot what that meant. They struggled with doubt in the face of difficulties. Then they forgot the lessons that they had learned from those difficulties. They'd forgotten that they'd learned to depend on God through hard times when life was good again. It's so easy to relate to because we all do it. That's why sometimes we have to willingly submit to discipline like fasting like a hard break in our habits, so that we can actually reform and renew our life patterns, partnering, partnering with the spirit in this, not in an involuntary way, not as a child being taken kicking and screaming <laughs> to the naughty step. This is a discipline that we can willingly choose. We do it so that we can walk more closely with God, so we can appreciate his word and taste and see that the Lord is good. We don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. We have Jesus as an example before us, who was tempted but did not sin, who remembered the word of the Lord, who submitted to discipline. How are you doing five days into the 40 days of prayer and fasting? No, how are you really doing? <laughs> It's pretty frustrating that we can't have this conversation face to face. Although, it is not an easy conversation to have, even when we are face to face. How are we doing in the 40 days of fasting? How are we coping with testing? How are we coping with hardship? How are we coping with temptation? It's not an easy conversation. 
It's not as if kids, I'm sure your kids don't sit there having an intelligent conversation and a reasonable conversation about the way that their parents discipline them in the here and now. Unless perhaps you might hear them grumbling about being grounded or having the phone taken off them. But appreciating discipline comes through maturity more often than not. As adults, you might have sat through this conversation yourself where you reflect on your own childhood and you remember the difficult patches, what what it taught you and how if you were blessed and you had parents that did this, a loving parent disciplined you and you have learned to appreciate it. But it isn't easy. It isn't easy to talk about it just as it isn't easy to go through it. So I really want to encourage you. (laughs) I want to encourage you to make the most of these 40 days of prayer and fasting. You may need to learn to appreciate the Lord's discipline. And that might be the priority for you in these 40 days. You may need to just reconnect with God. You may need to fast in order to focus on God. I pray you experience the blessing of God and his presence. I pray for you if you've identified negative patterns of thinking, a critical, angry, unforgiving spirit that you need to fast from in order to break its hold on you. This could be the time to partner with the spirit and with God's word so that that can happen. I pray for those of you who want to get back to reading your Bible and praying at a set time in the day, using the symbolic 40 days that Jesus spent being tested to kickstart fresh spiritual motivation and desire in your own life, following Jesus' example. I pray too that when, not if, you experience Satan's attack, you remember the word of God and the goodness of God. We do not live by our physical needs alone being met, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God has a lot to say to us as children and he wants us to take care to listen, to have a hunger for his spiritual provision and to have that hunger satisfied. I really pray for you if you are feeling totally unmotivated and uninspired by even the mention of 40 days of prayer and fasting. You might have not even picked up on it at all. Most of us find new motivation and inspiration in our spiritual lives from other people, from serving God at church, from chats with good Christian friends, from worship at church, from new wine conference, say, um, from retreats, or just from a change of scenery or a change of pace. Most of these things are gone right now, so we have to learn to value what we do have more. You may be feeling like committing to fasting, 40-day readings, or journaling is the last thing that you need or can face right now. But I want to encourage you by Jesus' example, who willingly went into the desert to be tested, to be disciplined. I want to also encourage you by the assurance that wilderness experiences lead to spiritual encounters with God, which change your life. Even if you also have to encounter Satan as well. The reminder of God's word to his people about their 40 years in the wilderness is a good reminder for us. Those 40 years in the desert were clearly a drag, putting it mildly, for the Israelites, but so much came from them. Luke 4 shows us that Jesus understood the value of resisting temptation and resisting the devil. When the devil tempts us to get doubt God, It is unpleasant, I I know, I've had these horrible experiences of doubt, but it presents a valuable opportunity. It's an opportunity to declare your trust for the Lord out loud, in your heart, in your head, in your spirit. It's an opportunity to raise up and honour the name of the Lord our Father, to remind ourselves that we are his children. It's an opportunity to remind ourselves, as Psalm 37 says, to take delight in the Lord and he will give us the desires of our hearts to commit everything that we do to the Lord to trust him and he will help us he will make our innocence our innocence radiate like the dawn 
and the justice of our cause will shine like the noonday sun. This is what God promises when we commit to him, when we subject ourselves to his discipline, when we submit by trusting him to what he wants for our lives. Jesus had to wait years before his innocence and the justice of his cause were gloriously revealed. But how worth it was it? That wait, that wait, how worth it was it? Not just for Jesus, but infinitely, immeasurably worth it for us, for all the sons and daughters of God. Let no amount of tempting by the devil to make you doubt that you are a child of God. Let it not enter your heart. Resist the devil and he will flee from you as he had to do from Jesus. He is not our Lord. We are not subject to him because we have a greater Lord and Father who will never let us down, who will always be there for us in every hardship and and testing and temptation like he was for the Lord Jesus. Praise his holy name. Yeah. Mm-hmm.